everybody. Welcome to the Sober Vibes Podcast. I am your host and sober coach, Courtney Anderson. You are listening to episode 124. Yes. So excited. We have a great guest today, but before I get started, know that the conversation, there's a part in this episode where Casey and I start talking because she starts apologizing about how the 12 steps didn't vibe with her. Okay. Not didn't vibe, but just it, it, she tried it. It wasn't her thing. No problem. So before we get into all that, I want to let you know, to go back to episode 122, I did a solo podcast and it goes along with this conversation. These two episodes go together. So definitely check that out. Okay. But that's not what we talk about today. It was just part of the conversation. The What we talk about today is the fears women have about giving up alcohol, which is a great conversation with my guest today, Casey McGuire Davidson. She is a sobriety coach, and she is also the host of the Hello Someday podcast. We really vibed. And... We have lots of similarities when it comes to specifically what we chat about and also to our coaching style. And I just Casey a lot. And here's a fun fact. Casey actually was kind enough to endorse my book that is coming out August 15th, 2023. If you have not gotten Sober Vibes, a guide to your first three months without alcohol, pre-order it now. The link is in the show notes. I still can't believe that I'm saying that I have a book for pre-sale. It's crazy. It's crazy. If you haven't yet, please rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And to if you are listening in real time, so if you're listening in the month of April, know that my one-on-one coaching has opened back up for one-on-one slot. So to apply to work with me, hit the link in the show notes below. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and always reach out to me on Instagram at Sober Vibes. So, so you can tell me what you thought of the episodes. I always love hearing back from you because of two things. One, It feels very nice to read your messages and the fact that you took the time out to send me a message of how this podcast has impacted you. I really appreciate that. Two, I get to connect with you and see who a a listener is, really, and that there is a person out there listening. I know people listen to this, but I like connection, and it's a thing with podcasting. You record this interview, you then put it out in the world, and you don't you can't see who's listening. So that's why I like the connection. And again, I just really appreciate you listening to the Sober Vibes podcast. Again, rate, review, and subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. Enjoy today's episode. Connect with Casey. If you haven't listened to her podcast yet, listen to her podcast. She's got some great stuff, great interviews over there, and is doing great things. All right. Keep on trucking and stay healthy out there. Enjoy today's show. Hey, Casey, welcome to the Sober Vibes podcast. Hey, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to be here too. And we just talked for 30 minutes in our (laughs) pre-interview. Yeah, we totally did. (laughs) So why don't you tell us your story? Tell us when you got sober and what brought you up to that point. Yeah, well, I quit drinking seven years ago, which is a little crazy to think about now when I was trying to moderate my drinking. I could barely get four days. I kept being like, all right, I need to take a break from alcohol. And I would make it about three days and then something good, bad, indifferent would happen. And I would go out and buy a bottle of wine. I probably, before I stopped drinking, was worried about it for a good decade. I was always a big drinker since college. I played on the women's rugby team. So it was sort of like a crash course in how to binge drink and black out and throw up. And I thought it was really fun. And then I went to my first job, which I found really stressful. And I was a management consultant and 23 years old in my bad suits, going to big companies and trying to pretend I knew what I was talking about. And so I would go home and open up a bottle of wine and get fuzzy. And I kind of thought that's what adults did. And 
So I drank pretty much my whole adult life, but sort of switched what I was drinking based on where I was in my life. So keg parties in college to cocktails when I was out in my 20s to bottle of wine with dinner once I was living with my now husband and married and dinner parties. And then once I had my son, who's 14 now, it was kind of drinking at night after I got home from work while doing all the baby stuff. And for a long time, I was sort of oblivious that there was a problem. I mean, I knew that I drank a lot. I knew I was hung over a decent amount, but it was part of my persona. Like I literally described myself as a red wine girl when meeting people like, Hey, I'm Casey. I'm from Seattle. I work in digital marketing. I'm a red wine girl. Like it was part of my description. And I hung out with a lot of drinkers as we do. So definitely got to the point though, where I was waking up at the middle of the night every day at 3 a.m. And of course I went to my therapist and was like, my life is so stressful. My job is so hard. And she asked me how much I drank. And I sort of gave the standard answer of a couple of drinks, a couple of times a week, like not a bottle of wine a night, every single night. And she prescribed me Ambien. So then I was drinking a bottle of wine a night and taking Ambien to sleep through the night, which is so dangerous. But I was still like, oblivious. I didn't know anyone who was sober. My family weren't big drinkers. I was sort of like the big drinker of the family. Almost everyone I knew certainly drank. A lot of them drank like I did, and they were all really successful working women, lawyers and doctors and all the things. And so I tried for a very long time to get a handle on it. I would do all right, I love red wine. I'm only going to drink white wine. I'm only going to drink when I'm out. So I won't drink all the time at home. And then it was, I'm only going to drink when I'm home. So I won't be tempted to drive and all, right? All the rules. And then I would be like, okay, I have a problem. And then three days later, nothing to see here. There is no problem. I never told my husband I was worried about my drinking. He never said anything to me. It was, you knew what you were getting into. We got together in our first job out of college. I was 22 years old. I was like, babe, I'm a red wine girl. And he was like, I kind of thought you'd grow out of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. So he was over it. He was kind of over it, okay. but he didn't want me to stop drinking. He just wanted me to not pass out on the couch right on a Wednesday night. Right, you know, I mean, right. we had a lot of fun drinking mm-hmm. to Italy and every anniversary was a wine tasting weekend and every date night was a pub crawl. So yeah. he drank just not like I did. He'd have one beer or two at home where I drank a bottle and wanted a little more. So it was really just dawning on me as I went along that this was a problem, I was hung over every day that I was walking into work and being like, yikes, am I an alcoholic or do I just abuse alcohol? Because if I just abuse it, then I can get a handle on it yeah. Stop abusing it. Right, right. And then I finally went to a therapist who specialized in anxiety and also addiction. I chose him specifically for that. And of course, went in and said, oh my God, my life, my child, my husband, my boss. And by the way, I drank a bottle of wine tonight. It was like, yeah, let's talk about your drinking. And I was like, no, let's talk about my boss. Right, right. But he encouraged me to go to AA. This was a decade ago. There really wasn't much else. I did. He was sober. He had gone through the 12-step program. I tried it for four months. I did stop drinking. So, you know, it worked in terms Mm -hmm. of me not drinking. It was not my jam. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, the meetings weren't my favorite. I didn't like the big book. I didn't like the steps. I'm not religious at all, sort of feel some kind of resistant to any direction about the kind of person I should be. Well, I got to say this because this is so funny you're bringing this up and this is no, this is no shade to anybody. I'm, I will have a solo episode about this, but it, in, I just interviewed a guy and he 
we have to stop apologizing that AA was not our jam because I feel like this is the direction that you, we have, because on the people who don't go through, continue to stay in the program, I think that there's a lot of respect because that you do know that it's worked, but it doesn't, it, it just didn't connect with you and that's okay. So yeah. I just, I okay. don't mean to I interrupt you, but you said that. And the reason is that I have a lot of friends who went through AA, yeah. the people who I met there are lovely yeah. and I found they are really protective of it. And I've been told like, you're killing people. If you say anything negative no, you're not. about the program. Fuck that. Yeah. Do you know yeah. how many, because I seriously, in my book, I express this with yeah. with 12 steps, therapists, and sober coaches, because sober coaches now are like, you quote unquote, fraud. <laughs> yes. And it's not, and it's, well, wait, people get certified. They do the steps that they need to. And why is this not good enough? Not so, valid. Yeah, I'm not. And yeah. I have my own thing towards the 12 steps. I participated. I took what I wanted and I left the rest. And I do. Any person I ever work with, one of the first, have you gone to uh, 12 step meetings? Yes, I did. Okay, cool. How many? Because I want to know, make sure that it's valid that you went and participated for a little bit so that you're just not judging it based off of one. Yeah. So it, it just comes to a point of, no, it just, everybody does not connect to the same thing. Yeah. So yeah. it's not- I love that you said that. So I went about four times a week for four months. And it, like I said, the people were lovely. And I agree with you about sober coaching and some other things because people, some you could get all the information you need on nutrition or working out from YouTube. But people hire a personal trainer or they go to group fitness programs or they hire a nutritionist because they want that one-on-one attention. They want that accountability. They want a program that's specific to them. And then a lot of people give you shade for charging for it. But at the same time, like I went to school, I've been doing this for a bunch of years. You wouldn't give a therapist shade for charging for their work. And I left a full-time job to do this and do it 40, 50 hours a week. So yeah, if, if how I found the 12 steps, I found it paternalistic and condescending. And why is something written by white men 80 years ago that hasn't really changed more valid than another approach? No, exactly. Well, and that, but here's the thing. This is what everyone needs to understand. There is a low percentage rate of people who sustain long-term recovery from AA. There is a low percentage rate of people who come out of rehab and have sustained long-term sobriety. It's no different from a coach. And because it's addiction, it is alcohol is glamorized. It's there's so much and there's so much under a person's that once you quit drinking, it's layer upon layer that there's more than just to I quit drinking. I have this one person who repeatedly asked me on Instagram, why is this so hard? Why is this so hard? Why is this so hard? And it's because it's fucking hard. Yeah, this is hard. There's days you have to dig deep solo dolo without the assistance of having a sponsor, having a therapist, having a coach in your ear. And it's just the amount of trauma you have had in your life, the addiction to the substance of alcohol, your current life. Not everybody has a fucking unicorns. It's it's scrunchies. Not everybody has a great cush home life. So it's very easy to just say fuck it and relapse. So from all of these things, it's a low percentage, but what you have to do a low percentage of success, what you have to do, you have to find what's right for you. And you said, then you went to this 10 years ago. So then you still continue to drink. Well, I went for four months. I stopped and then I got pregnant with my Ah. dog. So I sustained sobriety for a year. And then after my daughter was born, I would say the whole time I was pregnant, I was sort of like slowly doing the shuffle away from AA away Mm -hmm. from the sober groups I found online. I'm being honest. I didn't want to stop drinking forever. And we're going to, but ding, ding, ding. 
Right? There you go. You didn't, but that's the thing. I don't think it, success only happens when you're ready. And yes. when you're good and fucking tired and you're like, I want off this ride. I yeah. can't physically do this anymore. And when you know enough to be like, wow, I burned my hand on this hot stove enough. It's yeah. not going to be different. It's the substance. It's not situational kind of thing. Remove the alcohol and guess what? Like your hangovers get better, but a lot of times so does your anxiety and depression, ability to follow through and confidence in yourself and all the good stuff. Yeah. So I, my daughter was born and I decided I was fixed. My life was better. I'd learned a lot. My life was less stressful. My marriage was better. Go figure, right? Take a year off drinking and your life is less stressful and your marriage is better and you feel better. So I decided, you know, what most of us do, I'm just going to have a glass of wine or two on a date night with my husband every once in a while. And pretty quickly, meaning over a couple months, I was back to a bottle of wine a night, but now with a couple of month old baby and I would do pump and dump. I would do feeder and then have a glass of wine. And then she stopped breastfeeding and I went back to work and I went back to my regular habit of bottle of wine a night, 365 nights a year, unless I was trying to cut back or stop. And the whole time they do say that it ruins you for drinking. The whole time I knew too much. Like at yeah. this point, I wasn't oblivious. I knew alcohol was a problem. Every anxiety attack, every hangover, every time I couldn't remember the TV shows I watched the night before, every time I passed out on the couch. I was like, this is bad. This is unsustainable. I am going to have to stop drinking. I just didn't want to stop yet. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm still holding it together. I'm, I do all the things. I'm a great mom. I don't drop any balls. Still getting promoted at work. And I literally said to myself, I am only hurting myself. And then you step back and you're like, so I'm hurting myself every day of my life. And I still didn't want to quit. And I think we're going to talk about the mistakes that women make. And I think one of the mistakes that women make is believing that you have to want to stop drinking in order to do it. And what I've found is if you wait for that, you will be waiting for a very long time because It is once you get out of the drinking cycle, it's once you get away from drinking that you can look at it with clarity and be like, wow, I can't believe I was making my life so hard. I can't believe I was poisoning my body and feeling like garbage for 21 hours of every day for three hours of numbing out. I can't believe I was coming home in my seemingly good life and knocking myself essentially unconscious every night to check out of my life. And when women come to me and they're like, I don't actually want to stop drinking. I'm like, of course you don't, but you want to feel better. And you have to trust me that if you stop drinking, you will feel better and you will get past a lot of these limiting beliefs and fears that you will never have fun again and you will lose all your friends and you won't be able to go to business meetings, all that kind of stuff. Right. Well, and that's the thing. That's that's really the thing that underneath it comes. It's a lot of limiting beliefs and fears that are that are underneath it. Well, what do you think? What are some fears? You kind of touched on it, but what are some main fears you hear? Because I hear a lot. I know. And I just want to see if it kind of evens out that women have about giving up alcohol. Yeah. Well, what ended up working for me, and this really does tap into a bunch of fears, is I did hire a sober coach. That's why I became a sober coach. That was my path. And I started with a hundred day challenge. My coach was Belle from Tired of Thinking About Drinking. And we emailed every day. And so one of the mistakes I think women make is thinking about forever. Yeah. Thinking I if I stop drinking, I will never drink again. And 
I think that trips you up before you ever get started. I think that it is important to set a goal that is not moderation, that is not, I'm only going to drink twice a week or on the weekend, because then you never get out of that craving withdrawal cycle. Then you never disprove some of your fears about going to parties without drinking in an anniversary without drinking or a really hard day. There's always a reason to drink. But if you make a longer term commitment, that is not forever. You give yourself the space to feel better, to disprove some of those fears, to realize that you can still connect with your husband or get through a kid's tantrum. I quit when my daughter was two years old and that it's easier than when you were drinking. So biggest mistake I see women make is thinking about forever before I was, I'm like, that's like going on three dates with a guy you like and being like, okay, I have to decide at this moment if I'm never going to have sex with another man again, or if I'm going to dump him. You know what I mean? I want to share with you today about a new product that I love. Sober Vibes and Exact Nature have a shared mission, helping you get sober and thrive. Exact Nature's healthy, all-natural CBD products can help. They're made for changes in mood, focus, cravings, and sleep that can be a part of getting sober. Founded by a father and son, both in addiction recovery, they know these challenges firsthand and have created a line of products to amplify the hope in your journey. Exact Nature offers oils, soft gels, gummies, and creams, detox for cravings, serenity for calm and focus, and Z's for better sleep. There are thousands of CBD products on the market, but only Exact Natures are made for those of us in recovery. I'm a big fan of the Serenity. For 20% off your order, use code SV20 for 20% off your order at exactnature.com. That is E-X-A-C-T-N-A-T-U-R-E.com. The link will also be in the show notes below. You can use that code now and all year long. It's time to start feeling your best self and you can learn more at exactnature.com. Again, the link is in the show notes. I strongly recommend CBD to help you along your sobriety and recovery journey. Hey, I would love to share with you something that I think could work great for you. Imagine you just got sober. You're working your program, checking in with a recovery sober coach, checking in with your sponsor, maintaining your employment and thriving. Now imagine none of your closest friends or family believe you. This is why I'm sharing this because early on in my sobriety, there was a couple of times Matt didn't believe that I was sober. So much trust is lost during active addiction and it can be hard to convince loved ones that things are different, that you're different. This is where Soberlink can help. Soberlink's remote alcohol monitoring system is designed to help you sustain a sober lifestyle while rebuilding trust with loved ones. Small enough to fit in your purse or pocket and discreet enough to use in public. Soberlink devices combine facial recognition, tamper detection, and real-time results. So friends and family know instantly that you're sober and working towards your recovery goals. As a sober coach, I really can't think of a better tool to maintain accountability, strengthen community, improve sobriety to loved ones. Now, you might be thinking like, do I really need this? And honestly, it's different for everybody. I know quite a few people who have had to use this or something like this to prove to their spouses and or family members that they are sober. This does not just affect the person who is the drinker. I mean, a lot of damage happens during your active addiction and accountability needs to take place. And with this tool, you can show that. Let's make 2023 a memorable one. Please visit www.soberlink.com dot com forward slash sober dash vibes to sign up and receive $50 off your device. 
The link is in the show notes. Check it out. If you do get this device, please feel free to reach out and let me know how it has helped you in your sober journey. I do have to say, I, when CJ was born, those first couple months, my eye was getting a little wonky. The kid didn't sleep. I call him the little dictator. The little dictator did not sleep. So he was dictating me around a lot. And I sat there. And my eye was getting twitchy one night. And I'm like, I understand why moms drink. I get it. I got it. I sat in the new identity that I was in and could totally relate and almost taste alcohol in my mouth some nights when he would just be screaming in my face. Like, I get it. So like, even when you're saying you quit when your daughter was two. Think of that phase that your daughter was going into. Like yeah. that's pretty because each phase of a child's different. So it's just like any drinking's always going to want you to stay stuck because that yes. is what it is. So like you could use your children for an excuse forever. Yes. Forever. Or your marriage or your job yeah. or your social circle. I'll stop drinking when my boss isn't such a nightmare. I'll stop drinking when my life is less stressful, I'll stop drinking when I'm not with this group of friends where we drink after every baseball game. And that's actually one of the reasons that I named my coaching business and my podcast. I like that. Hello, someday, because so many of us say someday Mm -hmm. leave my job. Someday I'll stop drinking. Someday I'll run a 10K. Someday I'll do X. And you need to start your someday too. That's why I kind of, it doesn't have to be all or nothing, but you can start taking steps. You're not meant to go through life and put your head down and grit your teeth for a decade. That's no way to live. Well, and especially too with that shame and anxiety. What's another, just living with that alone. What other, what other fear have you heard from, from women? Yeah. I mean, one of the big fears I hear, and I know I had this too, was, which is kind of hysterical looking back is if I stop drinking, people will think I have a problem. I thought this, I thought, oh my God, everybody knows me about as a drinker. If I stop drinking, my colleagues and my boss will think I have a problem with alcohol. They will be uncomfortable around me. They will put a label on me as having a drinking problem or being an alcoholic. Like I don't want to be in that category And therefore, I'm just going to keep drinking, which is crazy. And so I told everyone, because I was a red wine girl, right? There was zero chance anyone was going to notice if I went to a happy hour or a dinner party and didn't drink. Right. I told everyone that I was doing a hundred day health kick that I wanted to get in shape. I wanted to see how much better I felt. I wanted to sleep better, have more energy, all of which is true. I said, I'm not drinking for a hundred days. That's all I told my husband as well. I didn't tell him I hired a sober coach. I didn't tell him I was worried about my drinking. I mean, I told him I was going to take a break before, so I don't think he thought that I would actually do it. And I do think the difference was having the coaching, having the support, having the real-time feedback from someone who got it. But I realized that there was a way to stop drinking in a really positive, empowering way where I didn't label myself and didn't have anyone else label me either. Everybody, of course, because we live in a drinking society, was like, God, when are your 100 days up? I'll save this bottle of wine for you. We have to go to this great bar when you're done. But when I got close to 100 days, people could see I was less stressed. They could see I looked better. They could see I was more happier and more calm. And so it wasn't a big leap at that point to say, you know what? I want to do six months. I want to see what else I can accomplish. I feel good. And then once I got to six months, I said I was going for a year. Once I did a year, I was like, you know what? I think I'm done drinking. I don't think I need it. And I think I feel better without it. But what stops a lot of women is I am going to be seen as having a problem. People are going to think I'm an alcoholic. And then they're going to think less of me and then they're going to judge me and be uncomfortable around me. So 
I'm just going to keep drinking. Yeah, it's like the uncomfortableness, because I remember this in my early sobriety. And I always was like, dude, I'm not, I don't, I do not have two heads. Yeah. But it's like this, this, this mindset, this attitude where it's, well, hey, fuckers, why don't you get comfortable with my sobriety? Why, why do I, for anybody who quit drinking, why is it that? We're the ones to make feel bad of well, well, we don't want to make anybody else uncomfortable. But that all goes back because many people who have drinking problems are the most fucking intelligent, empathic people oh. I have ever met in my life who were people pleasers. Yes. So oh it goes back to that, but let's normalize you get comfortable with my sobriety, motherfucker. Oh. Sorry, Casey. Well, I swear and, a lot. <laughs> oh, I swear a ton too. So I actually love that. Yeah. So so let's get rid of this. It's whether you are labeled an alcoholic or whatnot, it's, it's not shameful. Let's, yes. let's well, and repositioning it even in your own mind. I think that I've discovered that people play off whatever you put out there. Yeah. If it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. If it's a positive move you're making for your health they take it as a positive mood you're making for your health. Now, big drinkers are going to pressure you because you not drinking puts into question their drinking or they feel like they can't open another bottle of wine if you're not boozing it up with them. But what I try to do is, like you said, get comfortable with my sobriety. I think about it in what if you chose to become a vegetarian? So basically you say, I am making this choice because it works better for me because I I believe for whatever reason that I don't want to consume meat, that it's a healthy choice for me. Now, that does not mean that your husband, your mom, your best friend needs to become a vegetarian or to some extent, even modify their dinner menu for you. You like when I go to parties, I bring my own non-alcoholic beer. I bring my own ginger beer. I I don't expect them to accommodate me in the same way that I've had people come over where I didn't know they were a vegetarian. And they're like, oh, don't worry. I'll just have the salad and the rice and it'll be great. Or we're having a barbecue and they bring their own veggie patties. But I would never be like, oh my God, you don't eat meat. Eat the meat. Why don't you just eat the meat now? Like, why do they care? If they have a burger at a restaurant and you have the like spinach risotto. But here's the thing too. Nowadays, we have to make sure and you as having kids, it's okay. There's a peanut allergy, right? Yeah. So now we have to be uber sensitive to people's food sensitivities and allergies. Yeah. Now, why isn't any motherfucker sensitive to a person who legit is allergic to alcohol? Because that's yeah. really what it is when it comes yeah. down to it. Like you cannot process alcohol, but you're sitting there saying to me, like, well, no, you can just have one drink. Motherfucker, yeah. can you eat can you eat this peanut butter? No, it's just it might sound extreme, but it is no, true. But it, it's a hundred percent true. Like a kid comes over and the mom's, oh, he doesn't eat gluten. I'm like, great information. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you for telling me. Now I know not to offer a PB and J sandwich huh? this person. The other thing I think that is a fear that women have is that people won't want to hang out with them. Huh? They don't drink That's and they one. feel like everybody wants you to drink. Mm-hmm. Try to reposition that and be like someone saying, let's have a drink. All that means is they like you and they want to hang out with you. And they'd like to consider this conversation in the same way that someone says, let's get coffee. And they don't care if you have a chai latte or a cup of tea or a lemonade yeah. instead of coffee. It's shorthand. Like you call tissues Kleenex. Um, so yes, there are some people who are going to be bummed that you don't drink. And that's part of the learning process and education for them and for you, that it might be different, but maybe parts of it are better. You're my present. You remember the conversation. You're not distracted trying to signal 
the waitress to get you another drink before they bring the check because that's awkward. You know what I mean? Like yeah. maybe you go to a yoga class instead of going to a bar. Like these, you can still have fun. And the first time someone came over to my house who I didn't know that well at 5 p.m., and they were dropping something off. And I was like, if I don't offer them a drink, they will think I don't want them to stay and they will think I don't like them. That was what was in my mind. Yeah. And we still hung out and that wasn't required. And there are actually other ways to show someone that you want to continue to spend time with them. Yeah. And I do have to say on this, because it's always, I get it. If people, places and things trigger you, then you do have to work around with it. But I have to say with the friend group, whereas, well, my friends are a bunch of drinkers because I Mm -hmm. get this a lot and it's okay, but are you actually giving these friends a chance to meet you with where you're at in your sober life? Because your friends are all drinkers because that is what you did. You we're responsible for that too. It's not just all your friends. That's what you guys ended up doing for years and years and years together. So now it's the point too, where you have to put it out there like, all right, do you want to go for a coffee? Do you want to go for a breakfast? Not brunch, breakfast. Do you want to go see a movie? Let's go to a workout class and see what friends meet you at that. Because I think people would be more surprised at the friends who will meet them at that level. And then eventually come in time like, oh, this is so much nicer than sitting at a bar getting shit face. Yes. And then you're probably going to lose two to three friends that in the long run, you will see that it was they were just really great to snort a bunch of cocaine with and get drunk with. Yeah. I mean, and I that's totally what it was. Agree. I was surprised because I had a group of 12 friends, pre-kids, and then we all had kids around the same time. And we drank, of course a lot. Looking back, not everyone drank as as I did, but we used to go kayak camping and bring the bladders from the box of wine. All of our teacher t-shirts from our kayak camping trips had wine on them. Like people would be like, who's going to stay up with Casey and Holly so they don't fall in the fire. These were conversations. Right. And what's amazing is of our 12, three of us stopped drinking completely go figure there was <laughs> perhaps there was an issue there and then the rest of them drink or don't drink like they certainly drink less there are a couple who are still pretty big boozers and for a while i didn't go to obviously the like boozy wine moments the happy hour bars yeah. the dinners out Instead, we went to lunch, like you said, or to breakfast or to walks or to yoga. Um, Now I can go out to dinner. Mm. I don't care if they drink or don't drink, but I will still choose not to go to some stuff. And if people say to me, it won't be fun if I'm not drinking, my question is, is it just not fun? Is it something that either now or never you didn't want to do? Right. And so you don't have to do it. You can do something else. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely, and you definitely have to take yourself out of that socialness for a minute. Oh, I didn't like go out to dinner for a month. I just (laughs) didn't. And the first time that we were invited to a restaurant with another couple and it was a celebration because my husband got promoted. I was terrified and I was terrified to ask for my drink from the waitress. I was terrified what the other wife would think. And I talked to my sober coach about it. We made up a plan. We checked in before and after. And it sounds funny, but it was that block and tackling that I needed help with. And anytime you do something for the first time, it's going to be uncomfortable. I mean, I had to like really think about dates with my husband's. Mm -hmm. We used to always do pub crawl. So I was like, I was always the planner, of course. So that really helped. He'd be like, I don't care what we do. So I'd be like, okay, let's go to sushi because I've never drank sake and they have crap red wine. So, and we can sit at the sushi bar. So I was like, green tea, sushi, that's safe. Let's go to a bookstore and a coffee shop with live music, or let's go to a movie or let's go to a park at 3 p.m. and read books. He can have a beer. I can have my ginger beer or whatever mm-hmm. it was. So, but you have to plan for that. This scary. Mm-hmm. Of course it is. Yeah, because it's all, it, this is, it, you have to re, 
wire your brain to live in your new alcohol free world. Yeah. And then yeah. once you do, and once you start ripping the band-aids off of first vacation, first hang out with friends, first time having sober sex, you're like, yeah. oh, this isn't bad. I I fucked myself up so much for overthinking all of this. Yeah. And you actually yeah. go and enjoy yourself. And then and it's, sober sex is way better. Yes. Than drug sex. Yes, absolutely. And After you just you get through the first uncomfortable weeks. I don't know. Yeah. I've never done this. You know? Right. And that's the whole thing. And you rip all these band-aids off and then you're just like, oh, okay, this is cool. I can do this. And this is a whole new world I'm experiencing. And yeah. it, it's 20 times better. So, well, so what is one, what's one tip though, that you would suggest to a woman to overcome one of these fears? Yeah. I would say treat this as an experiment. Oh, that's good. Um, you know, that you don't have to decide forever right now. Yeah. But again, don't just try to moderate or cut back because you've tried that. You have tried that. And to observe what's harder and what isn't as bad as you thought it would be, but also to think about who you want to be and the things you always said you would do that you never do mm -hmm. because you're hungover, or your life has centered around drinking and to give yourself the opportunity to evolve and transform and get excited about it. I love it. That is a great tip. Where can people find you? Yeah. Well, my website is hellosomedaycoaching.com. I have a sobriety coaching course. I do one-on-one -on -one work. I have a completely free 30 day guide, 30 tips for your first 30 days. And I have a podcast called the hello someday podcast. It's for sober, curious women. And I have some really fantastic guests on there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on the sober Rise podcast. I will put Casey's information in the show notes below. Thank you. Thank Great you talking so with you today. And I'll be on your show soon. <laughs> Absolutely. I cannot wait to talk to you. All right. Thank you.